everyone! Today's video is going to be a bit different. It's been a while since I said that. I'm in between long, labor-intensive, edit-heavy projects, and so I thought today I'd take a break with a more low-key video, which is going to be part book review and part something else. <laughs> I am almost done reading Vincent Price's biography, written by his daughter, Victoria Price. I got this book for Christmas last year, and I showed it to you in a video. I do feel like I'm kind of breaking the rules by talking about a book before I've actually finished it, but I'm almost done, and I do know how it ends, and, well, this is my day to film, so it has to happen. <laughs> I think I've mentioned this to you before, but I am very selective with the actor and celebrity biographies and autobiographies that I choose to read. Um, I picked this one because, well, I like Vincent Price and was curious what he was like in private. I'd heard a lot of good things about him and heard that he was a really interesting personality with a number of varied interests, art being his biggest passion, and with this being written by his daughter, obviously you get a more intimate portrait. Victoria Price was very close to her father as a child until they became estranged after his third marriage. They were able to reconnect many years later, but at that point his health was already deteriorating. In writing this book, she wanted to put together a compendium of his life, but she also wanted to rediscover her father and reconnect with him and piece together all the things she never knew about him. She did copious research and was in contact with dozens of his closest friends and acquaintances. As a result, the book is quite long and thorough. I did have some trouble with how detailed it was. I felt like there were some things that didn't really need to be here, and there were some subjects that I felt like, I don't need to know this, or I don't want to know this. There is also quite a bit of what I refer to as biographer insertion, which is something I'm always wary of, as I don't believe a biographer should add his or her personal comments to someone else's life story, but at the same time, it's not just about Vincent Price. It is, especially part one, but part two is actually titled Father and Daughter, and focuses in large part on their father-daughter relationship. What gave me the most trouble, though, was actually the font, which is really on the small side and very dense and seemed a little faint, so that discouraged my reading. And it's a hefty volume. My hand is getting tired of holding it up for you like this. Um, it feels good. It feels like very high quality, but it is, um, well, if you're prone to reading in bed, this is the kind of book that you could knock yourself out with. It looks great, though, doesn't it? My reaction to Vincent Price, the person, though, is mostly favorable overall. I was delighted to find out that he had a huge sense of humor, something I'd always suspected watching his performances, and he was a genuinely talented, kind, generous, informal person who I think it would have been a pleasure to meet. And I was also tickled to learn that he was good buddies with several of my favorite actors, Joseph Cotton, Ronald Coleman, Edward G. Robinson. I also got answers I was looking for regarding how he felt about making all those horror movies and about being typecasted. As time went on, he grew increasingly unhappy about the quality of the projects he had to work on, but he graciously accepted his popular public image as a master of urbane villainy, and he always sought to give his best performance, no matter the role he was given. What I most enjoyed in the book were the humorous anecdotes, most of which were direct quotations from Vincent himself or from those who knew him best. Those were the best parts, I felt. I laughed out loud several times. So to try to summarize how I felt about the book, I would say it was okay. Um, some parts are better than others. I really like the anecdotes, um, but I could have done without some of the information, but I still like Vincent Price, which is good. Sometimes you read a person's biography or autobiography and you find you don't like them anymore, and that didn't really happen here, and now I want to watch a bunch of his movies that I've never seen before. Now you might be wondering which Vincent Price movies I've seen, which ones are my favorites, which ones I would recommend. I'd like to address that, and it seems like the most thorough and least complicated way to do that is to actually go on the Internet Movie Database and take a stroll through his filmography. So let's do that. 
All right, so Vincent Price's IMDb page. They have him most known for Lara, which is funny. I love that movie, but it's not exactly something I would refer to as a Vincent Price movie. Vincent Price is in it, but he's probably, I don't know, the fifth or sixth build actor, and there are so many other movies that are much more quintessentially him. But that's fine. His filmography, according to imdb.com, lists 207 acting credits, which is way too many. <laughs> that is a very high number. It's a lot if it's over 100. To be over 200, it's like, wow, <laughs> you were busy. All right, so I'm going to start all the way at the bottom with his first film, 1938 Service Deluxe. I have not seen it. It's a period romance film with Constance Bennett. He didn't think it was very good. He was very disappointed in his first film, um, but it actually was better than he thought, um, so they say. <laughs> the Shoemaker's Holiday, haven't seen. Then in 1939, Hollywood's Golden Year, he did two movies, neither of which I have seen, even though I have tried to see a lot of 1939 films. Uh, he was in The Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex, which is much more known to be an Errol Flynn, Betty Davis movie, and he was also in Tower of London, which I think would be more up my alley than The Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex. Tower of London is, from what I hear, a heavily fictionalized adaptation of Richard III. In this version, Richard III was played by Basil Rathbone, which I'm sure is a treat to see, and, um, Vincent Price plays Duke of Clarence. He's the one who gets drowned in a, um, a barrel of wine. In the 60s film, Richard III is played by Vincent Price. I would like to see both versions. I think it would be fun to compare them. Oh, and I forgot, Boris Karloff is also in the 1939 Tower of London, so that's a good cast. After that, he did another spooky-ish movie. I'm not sure that you can call either one of them a horror film, but getting there. Uh, he did The Invisible Man Returns and played The Invisible Man. I just saw this movie for the first time last week. I'm not going to talk about it too much here because I'm going to talk about it later. That same year he also was in a movie called Green Hell, which was directed by James Whale, but uh, according to what the book said, it was not up to James Whale's usual standard. Uh, after that is a movie that I have seen, The House of the Seven Gables, which I liked. I honestly don't remember it super well, but I did read the book a couple times, The House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I have it back here somewhere, and it's really good. I would recommend it. Not sure everybody would like it, but I did. Um, he also did Brigham Young, which is a Tyrone Power movie, haven't seen it. Did Hudson's Bay, haven't seen it. Did The Song of Bernadette, which I... Well, I'm not sure if I can say that I saw it. It was on TV, and I was in the room, but I was really young. Then he did The Eve of St. Mark. Don't... Oh, that's a war movie, um, where he plays a poet who is in combat. Not the star, but um, I thought that one sounded interesting, so I'd like to see that. 1944, he also did Wilson, which was the um, Woodrow Wilson biopic. Also the movie that Dwight Fry was supposed to have his big comeback in, except he died before it was completed. After that, Price was in Lara, which I've already mentioned. One of my favorite movies. I have reviewed it. It's a great movie. It's a great classic noir, romance, crime, drama, whatever you want to call it. Also funny. That year he also was in The Keys of the Kingdom, which is a Gregory Peck film that I've seen half of? We taped it, and I saw half of it. Should finish it. Ugh, there's a lot of movies like that. 1945, he did a movie with Tallulah Bankhead called A Royal Scandal. That's an Ernst Lubitsch movie. That year, he was reunited with his Lara co-star, Gene Tierney, who he said he loved working with. I love their movies together. I love Gene Tierney with Vincent Price. I love her with Dana Andrews, and I love her with Tyrone Power. And I just, I think she's one of my favorite actresses. Leave Her to Heaven is just one of those absolutely stunningly gorgeous Technicolor, I'm pretty sure it's Technicolor films, and oh, it is, it is a good one. After that, he was in a movie called Shock, which you would think might be kind of a horror film, but if I remember correctly, it's not really. It does take place in a mental hospital, 
but, um, and he was a bad guy, but I think he was a bad guy. I hope that's not a spoiler that I just gave away. For some reason, I can't remember super well what goes on in that movie. I think I liked it. After that, he finally got to play the lead opposite Gene Tierney in Dragon Wick. I really like this movie. It is spooky, but not horror movie. It is more gothic and strange. It kind of reminds me of certain other stories, but I won't say which ones because I don't want to give anything away. Um, strange movie, but I do recommend it. After that, he did a bunch of movies that I haven't seen. The Web, The Long Night, Moss Rose, Forever Amber. I would like to see Forever Amber. Um, Up in Central Park, which is uh, a movie that he did with Deanna Durbin. That's an unusual combination, and it was even stranger because he was cast as Boss Tweed, and he really was not the right fit for the part. Um, after that, he made his cameo appearance at the end of Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein as the Invisible Man, not that you see him. He was in a movie called Rogue's Regiment, which I haven't seen. He played Cardinal Richelieu in The Three Musketeers with Gene Kelly, which I haven't seen. I would like to. Every time I see pictures from that movie, I think, wow, that looks great, but it also looks kind of fluffy. He was in The Bribe and Baghdad, haven't seen either of those. He narrated a 1949 television short version of The Christmas Carol. I don't think I've... No, I think I did see that. Pretty sure. In 1950, he did The Baron of Arizona, which I think is a western, haven't seen it. He did Champagne for Caesar, which was his first opportunity to work opposite his idol, Ronald Coleman. I loved hearing that um, he so admired Ronald Coleman and that then they became friends. I'm so sorry to say, though, that I have not seen Champagne for Caesar. I had it on my watch list on YouTube for a very long time, and then suddenly it was taken down. Um, I don't think that it's been on TV. I need to get on that, because that is just a crime that I haven't watched that movie yet. Then he did another western, Curtain Call at Cactus Creek. Um, I believe that is a comedic western, and just the title sounds fun, Curtain Call at Cactus Creek. Uh, then he did Adventures of Captain Fabian. After that, he did His Kind of Woman, which is the Robert Mitchum Jane Russell movie. Um, I've heard really good things about Price's performance in this. It's another comedic role, and I would like to see it. Don't know why I haven't seen it yet. Um, then he started getting into television, so we'll just kind of skip over those. He was in The Las Vegas Story, which was also a Jane Russell movie, but with Victor Mature. And then 1953, The Game Changer, House of Wax, his first real horror film, I would say. Um, first gimmicky horror film also, because that was made in 3D and they made a really big deal about it. It is a remake of a 1930 two movie, The Mystery of the Wax Museum. That is a good movie, but I like House of Wax better. Um, not to be confused with the remake in, I don't know, 2005 with Paris Hilton. <laughs> um, House of Wax, I would say, is one of the top five must-see Vincent Price horror films. Then in 1954, he did a movie called Dangerous Mission. Then he had an uncredited role as Casanova in Casanova's Big Night, which is a Bob Hope film. That was 1954. That year he also did The Mad Magician, which I think I saw. I don't think I've seen this movie. <laughs> After that, he was in Son of Sinbad, which, according to the book, was not a good movie. 1956, he was in Serenade, which is a Mario Lanza movie. That means there's a lot of singing. Vincent Price doesn't do any singing, I'm sure. In 56, he also did a movie called While the City Sleeps, which I have seen. Good, we got another movie that I've seen. That is... I think of it as a newspaper movie. Um, it's a crime film. I remember it had a good cast. In addition to Vincent Price, it had Dana Andrews, Rhonda Fleming, George Sanders, Thomas Mitchell, Ida Lupino. More television than he was in The Ten Commandments. Honestly, I do not remember him in The Ten Commandments. There are so many people in that movie and it's so long. Um, I, I know what he looks like in The Ten Commandments because I saw a picture, but um, yeah, not really ringing a bell. 
Then he starred again opposite Ronald Coleman in Ronald Coleman's last movie, uh, The Story of Mankind, where they are basically trying to hash out whether mankind should live or die. I have never seen the movie because I always heard such not negative things about it, but so much criticism for it. It has a ton of people in it making cameo appearances as real historical figures, and um, it's just very silly. I would mainly be watching it for Ronald Coleman and Vincent Price, and I guess I've always felt that, well, if I'm gonna watch a movie with either of them, I would rather watch something else. But, you know, I need to see it sometime, just to be a completist. And then in 1958, he did The Fly. Now, the book, I was a little bit surprised at this. I got the feeling that maybe Victoria Price was not a big horror fan. Um, I don't want to say that she spoke derisively of The Fly and Return of the Fly, but she was kind of dismissive of them, also of the William Castle movies, and I was kind of taken aback by that. Um, I know that by today's standards, or even by 1980s standards, those movies are dated, but I still think The Fly is a great movie. There was a great anecdote in the book, though, about how they had to film the final scene of The Fly over and over and over again because Vincent Price and Herbert Marshall, another guy I love, um, could not stay serious. They just could not keep a straight face as they were trying to film this shocking twist ending, and uh, it just sounds like so much fun on the set that day. The next year, 1959, is when he really started to get into the horror swing of things. He was in House on Haunted Hill, the first movie he did with William Castle, who was really big into gimmicks and kind of corny horror stuff. That year he was also in the sequel to The Fly, Return of the Fly. The Fly was in color, Return of the Fly was in black and white. I actually think that the last time I saw them, I've seen both of them a couple times, I think the last time I came to the conclusion that I liked Return of the Fly a little bit better. I don't remember why now, um, and I think I'm in the minority in that opinion. The original Fly is considered the classic. I never hear people talk about Return of the Fly. <laughs> and of course nowadays you only hear people talk about the 80s movie, which I have no desire to watch because it's gross! 1959, he also, wow, this was a really busy year, he was also in The Big Circus, which is a circus movie starring Victor Mature and Rhonda Fleming and Red Buttons and Peter Lorre, and is there anybody else who I can't think of right now? Yeah, that's a good movie. I've seen it a couple times. Following that, he worked again with William Castle on one of my personal favorites, The Tingler. The Tingler. This is the movie that has an LSD sequence and um, is, according to some people, so corny, but I was terrified when I saw it as a little kid. Um, I didn't want to go to the bathroom because I thought that the tingler was gonna climb out of the toilet. Um, that happened to me a lot after watching scary old movies. I would think things would come out of the toilet. <laughs> I don't know. Um, that year he also was in The Bat, which is another horror movie. I believe it's a remake. I can't remember if I've seen it or not. And then 1960, we start the Roger Corman Poe saga with House of Usher. House of Usher is my personal favorite of the Edgar Allan Poe saga that Corman and Price worked on together. I don't know why. Vincent Price's hair and makeup and overall performance is just so weird. <laughs> 1961, he was in a movie called Master of the World. Haven't seen it. And then he did Pit in the Pendulum. I have seen this one, and maybe the reason why I didn't think it was that great was because I was kind of in and out of the room. But I don't know, with the Poe movies, they were working from the Edgar Allan Poe stories, which didn't have a whole lot for them to go on. They really had to come up with a lot of new material to stretch the the story out into a full-length film, and I don't know, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Pit in the Pendulum, I feel like, is the one where they stretched the most. 
That year, he also did a movie called Queen of the Nile with Gene Crane and Rage of the Buccaneers. I haven't seen either one of them. Then he did Confessions of an Opium Eater, which according to Victoria Price's book was not a good movie. And then he was in Tales of Terror, which is another Edgar Allan Poe movie, um, but not an adaptation of a single story, but rather an adaptation of three stories. Vincent Price, I believe, is in all three of them. One of them has Peter Lorre as well, and the third has Basil Rathbone in it also. So that's that's a good matchup. Convicts 4 I haven't seen. Tower of London 1962. We talked about this. Still haven't seen it. Need to watch it. If I had to choose one or the other to watch, I do think that I would go with the 1939 one. As fun as it would be to watch Vincent Price play Richard III, um, I like the cast of the older movie better and, well, I like older movies better than movies from the 60s. Pretty soon here we're gonna get to a point where I haven't seen any of these movies and I don't really want to because the quality starts to go down or it's just content that I don't really want to watch. Um, but we're not there yet. The Raven in 1963, this was another star-studded matchup. Vincent Price with Peter Lorre and Boris Karloff, and they had a grand old time. Um, they totally messed up the script. It was not supposed to be a comedy, it was supposed to be straight horror, but Peter Lorre kept on ad-libbing, and Vincent Price would work with it, and Boris Karloff was like, well, if they're gonna be silly, I guess I can be silly too. And this is also a very early performance from Jack Nicholson. Um, it's a weird movie. I have seen most of it, if not all of it, it was many years ago. After that, he was in Diary of a Madman, which I saw about 20 minutes of and then quit. I, was, I didn't like it. Then he was in Beach Party, which is one of those Annette Funicello, Frankie Avalon beach movies, teen movies from the 60s. Um, I probably won't watch that. Those don't appeal to me at all. He was in The Haunted Palace, which I have seen. I think Lon Chaney Jr. is also in that one. Then he was in Twice Told Tales, which was kind of trying to work off the success of Tales of Terror, doing the same thing with Nathaniel Hawthorne's stories that they had done with Edgar Allan Poe's stories. I don't think that I've seen any of that one. Maybe I have. The last movie he did in 1963 is one that I have definitely seen. I talked about it sometime in the last year, I believe. The Comedy of Terrors, which has that star-studded cast coming together again. Peter Lorre and Boris Karloff, uh, joined by Basil Rathbone. Um, it's a quirky movie, um, a horror comedy, a little more comedy than horror. In 1964, he was in The Last Man on Earth, which was the first adaptation of Richard Matheson's I Am Legend. Um, The Last Man on Earth is probably my favorite of the three adaptations of that novella. Um, the other two being The Omega Man with Charlton Heston in the 70s and I Am Legend with Will Smith in the early 2000s, I think it was. I prefer the atmosphere of The Last Man on Earth and um, there's something about it that's spooky without even really trying and I think that Price does a really good job carrying the movie. After that, he did another Poe movie with Roger Corman. Is it the post cycle? Was I calling it the post saga? I think it's the post cycle. Whatever. <laughs> he played Prince Prospero in The Mask of the Red Death. This is yet another one where they took the main story and added a whole bunch of meat to it. I think it's said that they actually combined two post stories. This one, I really liked the final sequence. I think it has some really cool effects and design and it's kind of trippy. Um, the rest of the movie I felt kind of eh about. After that, he made another Poe movie with Roger Corman, and I think this is the last one, The Tomb of Lygia, which is based on the Poe story, which is just titled Lygia, and uh, I really liked this one. I'd say it's a little bit more of a mysterious gothic romance than a horror flick. And then a movie called City in the Sea, haven't seen that. And then he did another 
wacky movie that appeals to the teenage crowd, Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine, which was kind of like a spoof of James Bond. You get the impression reading the book that around this point he started to get a little bit bewildered by the scripts and uh, by what the other actors were doing. It was like he'd entered a whole other world. The Dr. Goldfoot movie was popular. I haven't seen it. It sounds really silly to me. Um, but they made a sequel in 1966, Dr. Goldfoot and the Girl Bombs. Uh, it did not do well, so, so much for that. House of a Thousand Dolls, The Jackals, haven't seen either one of those. Witchfinder General, which I don't think is something I would enjoy. He narrated a movie called Spirits of the Dead, did a movie called More Dead Than Alive, um, a movie called The Trouble with Girls, which is an Elvis movie, but not one of the big Elvis movies. Oh, finally, here's a movie that I've seen, 1969's The Oblong Box. I didn't actually like this movie that much, but um, it did have a saving grace, and that's the fact that it was uh, his first time working with Christopher Lee. Um, they were only in one scene together, which was disappointing, but it was kind of worth it. Not really. <laughs> it wasn't really worth it. I did not really enjoy the movie that much. But that was fun. And then he and Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing um, joined together again for 1970's Scream and Scream Again. I have not seen this movie. I think that it's another anthology horror film. I think it sounds like fun to see those three masters of the horror renaissance working together. And What's really fun is what a good time they had being together on set. I really enjoyed those stories. I've seen the pictures of them hanging out together, um, and I don't know, it just makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside. I've read Peter Cushing's autobiography. It was delightful. He was a delightful man. Um, still haven't read Christopher Lee's autobiography. Um, I've heard it's really long. He had a crazy life. He was into so many things. But Vincent Price was able to bridge both generations of classic horror movie actors. He got along so well with Peter Lorre and Basil Rathbone and Boris Karloff, and he got along so well with their successors, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, and uh, it just sounds like they all had so much fun together. Also in 1970, he narrated something called An Evening of Edgar Allan Poe. That wasn't mentioned in the book. Um, also Cry of the Banshee. I haven't seen that. And then in 1971, he was in The Abominable Dr. Fives, which I still have not seen, or I haven't finished it. Years ago now, I saw the first half. I got as far as uh, some guy wearing a frog mask um, being murdered, and for some reason, I had to stop. I don't think it was because I was like, all right, well, I've had enough of this. Um, I think I actually had to go do something else. I've always intended to go back and finish it, and it just never happens. I think I was a little surprised by the movie because I didn't realize that it was a comedy as well as a horror movie. Um, it has some very kooky moments, and I didn't see that coming. It's also a pairing of Vincent Price and Joseph Cotton. Yay. And that movie did well enough that they made a sequel in 1972 called Dr. Fives Rises Again. I haven't heard as many good things about that one. And then he was in a movie called The Aries Computer, which I don't think was even mentioned in the book. And then he was in Theater of Blood, which was kind of one of his last big movies. Um, he plays a Shakespearean actor who gets revenge on his critics and kills them according to murder scenes in the Shakespeare plays. I would like to see this movie. I've heard good things about it, and if you ever wanted an opportunity to see Vincent Price do all kinds of Shakespeare, this is your best bet. Now we have a long stretch of movies that I have never seen. Madhouse, It's Not the Size That Counts, Journey Into Fear, which I don't think has anything to do with the 1943 Joseph Cotton and Orson Welles movie. 
Um, the Butterfly Ball. Uh, did a lot of collaborating with Alice Cooper at this point. Uh, 1979's The Scavenger Hunt, 1980's I Go Pogo, The Monster Club, Bustin' Loose. I haven't seen any of those. Uh, in 1982, he narrated um, Tim Burton's Vincent, which is an excellent short film. I definitely recommend that. I watched it on YouTube, so it might still be on here. Um, although, you never know these days. In 1983, he was reunited with Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing in House of the Long Shadows. I'm not sure if this is an anthology film or not. I haven't seen it. Um, again, I think it would be fun to check that out, to see them together, if they are together. And even if they're not together, those are three actors that are always worth seeing. 1983 also was the year that he did the narration for Michael Jackson's Thriller, which I'm sure is what a lot of people know him from first and foremost. 1984, Bloodbath of the House of Death. Doesn't sound like my kind of movie. Started doing some things for kids. Fairy Tale Theater, The Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, Greatest Adventure, Stories from the Bible, which looks like an animated series. Um, he played King Herod. Um, ah, 1986. Here's something I've seen. The Great Mouse Detective. This is a fun, uh, it's a Disney movie, right? Yes, Disney movie, which is a fun parody, send-up, whatever you want to call it, of the old Sherlock Holmes movies with Basil Rathbone and uh, Nigel Bruce, and Vincent Price plays Professor Radigan or Ratigan. Um, great voice work. Movie called Escapes, which I haven't seen. I haven't seen anything else here from a whisper to a scream. I have heard good things about The Whales of August that stars Betty Davis and Lillian Gish, I believe and uh, it's a very critically acclaimed movie. A couple more things, Dead Heat in 1988, Catch Fire in 1990, and in 1990 he was in Edward Scissorhands playing the inventor. I tend to think of Edward Scissorhands as his last movie, but it's not according to this list. He has uh, four, one, two, three, four, four acting credits following that, but um, I don't know. I just, I think of it as his last work and it certainly would be a good note to go out on. It's a small role, but it's crucial, and his scenes are so memorable. That is one of those movies that it's like a tragedy, but a comedy, and it is always riding that line. It could go either way, and um, Vincent Price in that movie is so bittersweet. Um, it's almost tough to watch because he's so old and so frail, um, but still awesome. All right, so that took a lot longer than I expected it would. Um, thank you for sticking around through this leisurely stroll through his filmography. I have always contemplated doing something kind of like this, didn't know how it would go. Hopefully you were able to follow that and get some recommendations out of it. If not, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am curious to hear what you all have to say on the topic, so go ahead and share your favorite Vincent Price films and performances in the comments below if you like, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching!